Hello everybody, welcome to this uh, episode of Neelam Path Lectures Pursue and this is Dr. Nadeem. As you must be aware that Neelam Path Lectures are available on YouTube and you can listen to these lectures. Uh, they are freely available and they are there in the YouTube Neelam Path Lecture channel and you can go to the playlist where all the lectures are arranged in a serial order. We also have a telegram group where you can get all the information regarding Neelam Path Lectures and we have a Google Drive where all the PDF is uploaded. You can use the master integration key to access this. And these are the disclaimers. And this is phase three, as you must be aware. And in this phase three, we have all recorded pathology lectures. And finally, uh, in phase three, we have been able to start the dermatopathology, which is pursued 26. And uh, this will be a series of around uh, 30, 35 lectures in dermatopathology. And, this, and the lecture topics are all enlisted in the Google Drive. You can go and check on that. And the lectures will be, av uh, will be available randomly, but then they can be arranged and viewed in the playlist as per the sequence as we arrange them. Today, we have the first lecture in dermatopathology. And to speak on that, we have uh, the topic for the day is histology of skin and adnexa and that will be streaming from Fortis Anandapur and to speak on that we have Dr. Shaurav Bhomik who is an MBBS from Calcutta and MD Pathology. Presently is a consultant histopathologist and lab head at the SRL Limited Fortis Hospital Anandapur, Kolkata. Dr. Saurav's areas of interest is oncopathology, GI pathology and cytopathology. He's got multiple publications in international and national journals and is a member of the Indian Academy of Cytology, West Bengal Cytological Society, Calcutta Association of Practicing Pathologists and also a member of the Gut Chat Club of Kolkata. So he will be taking the first lecture on the dermatopathological series which will be on histology of at skin and adnexa. So with that I hand over to Dr. Shaurav to start his lecture. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, today we are going to discuss the basic topic of dermatopathology that is the histology of skin and adnexa. Though it is an elaborative topic, we will try to stick to the morphological findings of the skin histology and we will try to make it as interesting as possible to all of you. The skin is a triple layered membrane covering the exterior of the body which comprises of mostly three parts, one is the epidermis, then dermis then subcutaneous adipose tissue. In adult, it weighs over the 5 kg and covers a surface area of approximately 2 meters square and which comprises 15% of total body weight and it's definitely, definitely the largest organ of the body. There are various functions of the skin. It mostly, the main function is it acts as a mechanical barrier against the external substance. It, it has some immunological function which regulates the body temperature and electrolyte balance. It is an important organ for sensuality and psychological well-being and it expresses the various disease manifestation of skin itself but also of the other internal organs with cutaneous manifestation by which we can prevent the disease. If we look at the basic histology of skin, it comprises three parts as I previously mentioned. The most superficial part is the stratified squamous epithelium with a thick keratin layer over it, which is epidermis. Below it, there is the fibrocollagenous area with some vascular structures. There may be presence of some smooth muscle, skin adnexal structures, which is the dermis. And below dermis, there is hypodermis, and which is, and where there is lobulated mature adipocytes with some fibrous vascular septa. We will come gradually one after another. Uh, Let us first discuss the epidermis. In epidermis, there are four kinds of cells. The predominant cell is the keratinocytes, followed by there are also presence of melanocytes, Langerhans cells, and Markel cells. Epidermis contains the opening of the eccrine ducts in the form of acrocelingium and hair follicles, and it also contains some free nerve actions in acetate which are acetate with the language. 
if you look at the keratinocytes, keratinocytes, there is a stratified membrane of composed of the squamous cells, and there are four parts of this stratified squamous epithelium. If we go from below upwards, the lowermost part is the stratum basalis, and this is also the mitotically activated part, and where from the same turnover occurs, and so it is also called the stratum germinicatum. And over it, there is five to six layers of cells, which are mostly polygonal in shape, and this is called the prickle cell layer or stratum spinosum. Over the stratum spinosum, there is two to three layers of cells having the thick basophilic granules in its cytoplasm. This, so these are called the granular cell layer or stratum granulosum. And in the most superficial aspect, there is the presence of mostly mature keratinocytes and which are rich in keratin deposition. These are called the cornified layer or stratum corneum. There is dermal epidermal junction. In dermal epidermal junction, the dermal fibrocorrigilus stroma is projected in some papillary parts, which are called the papillary dermis. And in between the papillary dermis, there is project downward projections of the stratified squamous epithelium in the form of the reti regions. Coming to the basal cell layer, the basal cell layer is a mitotically active cell that gives rise to the other keratinocytes. And it is a single cell layer above the basal membrane. If you look at the cells, the cells are mostly columnar to cuboidal with a basophilic cytoplasm with high insulin ratio. Nucleus is round to oval with coarse chromatin and indistinct nucleoli. And these cells contain melanin and in their cytoplasm as a result of pigment transfer from the neighboring melanocyte. The basal cell layers are connected to each other by the help of the specialized intercellular connections, which are known as desmosomes. They are located in the plasma cell membrane, and these desmosomes are aligned perpendicular to the epidermal basal membrane, and which are called the hemidesmosomes. So, in the basal aspects, these basal cells are attached with the basal lamina by help of hemidesmosome. And in between the basal cells, the cells are attached with the desmosomes. And dermatitis involved in the basal cell layer causes a vacuolar degeneration leading to subepidermal vesicles or subepidermal bulla, as seen in graft versus old disease or lupus erythematosus or erythema multiforme. Coming to the squamous cell layer or stratum spinosum, these cells are of 5 to 10 layers of thickness and they are larger than the basal cells. They are polygonal or polyhedral in shape and somewhat basophilic cytoplasm with round nucleus. They have prominent intercellular bridges, which are the connections in between the cells and which looks at the spines. Or that's why these are called the stratum spinosum. And uh, these intercellular bridges have become prominent due to retraction of the plasma membrane during tissue processing, whereas the desmosome remains fixed and with correlate with the intercellular bridges. If you look at the structures of the desmosome, it is composed of different polypeptides. Some are cytoplasmic component and some of the transmembrane component. The transmembrane component are the desmoplein or desmopholin, and cytoplasmic component are the desmoplakin, placoglobin, placophilin. And in pemphigus, the antigens are localized in the cell membrane or in the desmosomes of the cells. And intercellular space is of constant dimension in and contain neutral mycopolysaccharides. There are some cells with pale cytoplasm are seen in the stratum spinosum, which have the perinuclear halo around them. And these cells are called the talker cells, and they are supposed to be the non-neoplastic counterpart of the pilot cell, or non-neoplastic memory elements. 
as the distribution of cells has been found that they are seen in the epidermis of the nipple, the axillary nipple, and the pubic regions or in the milk line distribution. So it has thought to be the precursor of the memory or external repetitive stages. Morphologically, these cells need to be differentiated from the paget cells because even a histochemical expression and mesen staining patterns are same as like paget cells. In paget cells, the nuclear ATP is much more in respect to the topper cells. And the cells have irregular hyperchromatic nucleus with prominent nucleoli. Mitric activity is also seen in case of the paget disease or paget cell. This is not present in the topper cell. In the stratospinosum, the commonest, there are some common inflammatory changes are there. Uh, there may be the intercellular edema, which can be seen in allergic contact dermatitis. There may be acanthosis, which means the thickening of the epidermis. It is seen in various reactive and inflammatory conditions. Uh, psoriasis is one of them. There may be thinning or atrophy of the epidermis, which may be seen in discoid lupus erythematosus. There may be acantholysis, that is detachment of the keratinocytes because of changes involving the intercellular junction, as seen in the bullous disorders of pemphigus and pemphigoid. And there may be dyskeratosis or abnormal keratinization, as seen in malignant squamosal neoplasm. Coming to a general cell layer, these are one to three layers of flattened cells lying parallel to the skin surface over the stratum spinosum. They have in their cytoplasm rich basophilic granules, which are called the keratohyaline granules. These keratohyaline granules should be differentiated from the trichohyaline granules, which are red in color in the routine H and E sections, and they are produced from the inner root sheath of the hair follicle. This granular cell there increases in some disease like lichen planus and decreases in some disease like psoriasis. And so the assessment of this granular cell layer helps us to identify various disorders. And this keratohyaline granules actually secreted, secretes some propilagrin. The propilagrin is the precursor protein of filagrin and which promotes the aggregation of keratin filaments in the quantified layer. That's why filaggrin prevents the allergen penetration into the skin. And when there is some mutation in the filaggrin gene, these allergens can, can be easily exposed to the Langhan cells and thereby leads to atopic dermatitis or other allergic skin condition. Coming to the quantified layer, it is composed of multiple layers of polyhedral eosinophilic keratinocytes that lack a nucleus and cytoplasmic polyhedral. It is the most differentiated cells of the keratination system, composed entirely of the high molecular weight keratin filament. In formalin fixed sections, the polyhedral layers are arranged in a basketry pattern and they eventually shade from the surface of the skin, and this process takes around 20 to 45 days. In some part of the body, like palm and soul, there is there is presence of an extra layer of skin which called called the stratum lucidum. This is a homogeneous eosinophilic zone present in between the stratum corneum and stratum granulosum, and this is rich in protein-bound lipids which are contained in the lamellar granule, energetic enzymes, and sulfhydryl group secreted by the granular cells. If you look at the common abnormalities of the quantified layer, that, that is, if there is increased thickness of the quantified layer, that is called the hyperkeratosis, as seen as ichthyosis. In hyperkeratosis, if it contains a nucleus, then it is called the parakeratosis, otherwise it is called the orthokeratosis. Parakeratosis can be seen in actinic keratosis and many other skin disorders. And there may be presence of fungal organism in the stratum corneum, which can be highlighted by PA stains, which are diastasis resistant, like, like superficial dermatophytosis. If you look at the basement membrane zone, 
it is actually an undulating thin PS positive layer which separates the basal layer from the dermis. The basal cells are attached to the basal lamina by some connection, connecting molecules which call the hemidesmosome. And if we look at structures of a basal layer, there are four distinct layers. Most superficial is the plasma membrane of the basal cells. This is the plasma membrane of the basal cells which contains the hemidesmosomes. This is the, these shadows are from the hemidesmosomes and followed by the lamina lucida. This is the lamina lucida, this is the electron lucid layer and which consists of the transmembrane component of hemidesmosome anchoring filament complex and it is the site of the blister formation in case of dermatitis herpetiforme. The bull in Bullas when figured antigen 1 is located in the intracellular component of the hemidesmosome and Bullas when figured antigen 2 is associated with the transmembrane component of the hemidesmosome anchoring filament complex in the lamina lucida. Then comes the lamina densa. This is the electron dense layer and it is composed mostly of the type 4 collagen. And after the lamina densa, there is the pars fibroreticularis or sublaminar densa, sub densa zone. It contains mainly the anchoring fibrils that is type 7 collagen that attach the basal lamina to the connective tissue of the dermis. Antibodies taken the epidermolysis bullous acid beta react with the carboxy terminals end of the type 7 collagen. Coming to the melanocytes, these are the dendritic cells which are derived from the neural crest. In epidermis, these melanocytes are located along the basal layer and they can be seen as a contracted nucleus with perinuclear halo. And uh, the dendritic nature of the cells cannot be seen in the routine HND sections that can be visible when they are stained with uh, some immunohistochemical markers like a sandwich as in this picture. And these cells are smaller than keratinocytes, have ovoid nuclei, and they produce melanin, and which can be red, this is called the fumelanin, or yellow black, is called the eumelanin. Melanin protects our skin from the non-ionizing UV radiation. If you look closely to the melanin synthesis, this melanin synthesis occurs in a lysosome related organelle in the melanocyte. This lysosome related organelle is called the melanosome. This, there is maturation of melanosome which occurs in four stages. In stage one, the melanosomes are usually round with almost no melanin in them and this, uh, this can be seen in balloons and melanoma. In stage two, melanosomes are ellipsoid and melanin deposition started with in stage 3, melanin deposits are prominent and in stage 4, the melanosomes are fully packed with melanin, obscuring the internal structures. These melanosomes containing melanin and then transfer to the basal keratinocytes by the dendrites of the melanocytes and also to the hair follicular cells. Then transfer of this melanosome to the keratinocyte occurs by phagocytosis of this melanocytic dendritic process containing the melanosome. And this process is called the pigment donation. In this picture, it is a keratinocyte where there is multiple intracytoplasmic melanosomes containing melanin at the same, and which actually phagocytosed from the dendritic process of the melanocytes. So, epidermal melanin unit is one melanocyte which is associated with 36 keratinocytes to whom that melanocyte can deliver melanosome. Number of melanocytes in every race is actually almost constant. That is one melanocyte for 4 to 10 keratinocytes. And color of skin is determined by the number of melanosomes and size of melanosomes present in the melanocyte and keratinocyte, but, but not with the number of melanocytes. If we uh, look at how to detect the melanin, we can do some special staining like Fontana-Masson silver stain 
which in this picture we can see that the basal layer of the stratum basalis is rich in melanin pigment deposition with a stain by nothing called a silver stain and we can do some immunohistochemical markers like isandet isandet is a highly sensitive ASC marker for melanin but it's not specific because it is also seen in Langerhans cells, one cells, Ekrine and Apocrine duct gland cells. I see for melan A, this is a melanocytic differentiation marker and uh, this is comes positive in normal melanocyte in common nevi, with nevi malignant melanoma. And I see for HMA45, by this, uh, this actually doesn't react with the normal adult melanocytes, these are expressed in the environment melanocyte and can also be seen in the melanoma cells, sweet nephi, dysplastic nephi or other melanocytic neoplastic condition. And the abnormalities of melanin synthesis can be seen in vitiligo where there is an absent in number of absent or reduction in the number of melanocytes. And in albinism, there is defect in melanin synthesis, that is the number of melanosomes are reduced, but the number of melanocytes are normal. Melanocytic hyperplasia in lentico, benign and malignant melanocytic neoplasm. There may be melanocytic hyperplasia or melanocytic hyperplasia can also be seen as a reactive condition with some other neoplastic disorder like dermatofibroma. In Frecule, there is an increased pigment donation to that just in the keratinocyte by the melanocyte rather than melanocytic hyperplasia. Coming to the Langerhans cells, this Langerhans cells is another mobile tendinitic antigen presenting cell present on the epidermis. They are present in the mid and upper part of the epidermis. And in each and, C, in each and E sections, the dendritic nature of the cells is again is not prominent, which can be seen in the uh, is 100 eye staining. These cells can be detected by some histoenzymatic staining by ATPase. And I see for is 100 PD1A langerin can also be done. In electron microscopy, there is no hemidesmosome, tonofilament, or melanosome in these Langerhans cells, but there is presence of characteristic beer vectranium and which is the rod shaped organelle around 100 nanometer to 1 micrometer in size with an occasional bulb at one end. So that gives a tennis racket like appearance. This Langerhans cells are present in the epithelium, lymphoid organ, and dermis. This Langerhans cells are increased in inflammatory conditions like contact dermatitis as nodular aggregates in epidermis and Langerhans cell hysterocytosis there is can be seen in bone and other organs. Coming to the Merkel cells, Merkel cells are scattered and irregularly distribu distributed around the basal cell layer of the epidermis. They are grouped together in cluster along with the dilated sensory nerve ending and which forms the mechanoreceptors and that mediate the tactile sensation and that's why these cells are mostly seen in the glabrous skin of the digit, lips and oral cavity and also on the outer root sheath of hair follicle and where this tactile sensation is can be appreciated much better. Uh, but these Merkel cells cannot be routinely uh, cannot be distinguished from other epidermal cells in routine histological procedure. It can be identified in electron microscopy where there is presence of desmosomes and uh, some parallel cytokeratin filament around the perinuclear zones. And these parallel cytokeratin filaments in the perinuclear zones can also be highlighted by immunohistochemistry with the keratin stains like no molecular keratin or CK20 and other then CK20, these cells are also possible for the neuron specific analysis with homogranin pinotopicin. Now, let's come to the adnexal structures or pilar unit. This pilar unit is composed of hair follicle, pibaceous gland with 
created pili muscle along with eccrine glands and apocrine glands. We will come to them one by one. Let's first discuss the hair follicle. The hair follicle is divided into three segments. One is the infundibulum, then isthmus, then inferior segment. Infundibulum is the portion of the hair follicle which is from the epidermis up to the up to the opening duct of the cerebellus glands, and isthmus is the cerebellus gland opening to the insertion of the erector pili muscles. And beyond the erector spiny muscle, the lower part is called the inferior segment, and where there is presence of some vascularized dermal papillary component, which form the hair bulb. If you look at the hair matrix, there are presence of six cell layers. Most inside are the hair medulla, then the hair cortex, then the hair cuticle, and then then comes the inner root sheath. Which composed of cuticles of the inner root sheath, axillary layer, and hairless layer. This inner root sheath is covered by the outer root sheath. This outer root sheath actually composed of glycogen-rich, clear-looking cells, clear circulation cells. And so, any neoplasm which shows this outer root sheath of hair follicle differentiation that also uh, shows the presence of like this kind of clear cell area with peripheral palisading of the nuclei, like in Trichilemoma. And there is also some abrupt keratination from the outer root sheath, and which is called the Trichilemoma type of keratination that again can also be seen in the tumors with hair follicle differentiation. Dendritic melanocytes are present only in the upper half of the hair bulb, and inactive or amelanotic melanocytes are present on the Outer root sheath, and in the inner root sheath, there is presence of the trichohaline granules, which are reddish in color or eosinophilic in color. So hair growth occurs in various phases. The mostly the active growth phase is called the anagen, and in our scalp, around 80% of hair belongs to this anagen phase. Followed by then comes the catagen, where the involution of the hair starts and which is driven by the apoptosis. And next is the telogen, which is the relative resting phase. This catagen phase, hair, uh, hair cells, hair cells remain in catagen, catagen stage for two to three weeks, and can be in telogen phase for a few months. Coming to the sebaceous glands, these glands from the pilo sebaceous units and they present in close proximity to the hair follicles and they are the lobulated structures around the hair follicles and the secretion pattern of these glands is a holocrine that is the single cells are dislodged from the glands to this duct to cause a secretion. These sebaceous glands are absent in palm and sole and they are most prominent in the facial skin and buccal mucosa, vermilion of lip, labia majora, labia minora. And peripheral, if we look at the structures of the sebaceous glands, they are mostly formed by the mature sebaceous cells or sebocytes. The sebocytes have the abundant, clear looking cytoplasm containing lipid vacuoles, which causes nuclear indentation. And at the periphery of the lobules, there are presence of the germinative cells of the sebaceous gland and which has a flat large nuclei and vesophilic cytoplasm without the lipid droplets. Coming to the eccrine glands, these eccrine glands are the true sweat glands and they are responsible for the thermoregulation in our body. They are found in higher number in palm, sole, axilla, and forehead. They have both secretory and excretory function and they are usually present around the junction of the reticular dermis and subcutis and there is usually presence of fat cells around them whether it is present in the dermis or subcutis respect of the site and the secretory portion of this gland is the convoluted tube and uh, this 
These globules of glandular structures with central lumen and three types of cells are present in the equine glands. They are the clear cells, myoepithelial cells, and dark cells. And these cells closely. The clear cells are present over the basement membrane or myoepithelial cells. They have eosinophilic, pale, finely granular cytoplasm with round nuclei. These are the clear cells present in the equine gland secretory portion or secretory component. There may be presence of the deep invagination of the luminal membrane in between the cells forming the intercellular canaliculi. And this intercellular canaliculi can be highlighted nicely in this picture by the CES staining, and which highlights a luminal membrane and in the intercellular canaliculi. And in the tumors which have this equine gland differentiation, and they also show some presence of intercellular canaliculi like the original equine gland structures. The clear cells contain abundant mitochondria and pH positive diastase levile glycogen in its cytoplasm. And if you look at the dark cells, these dark cells are present in the luminal border of the gland. They contain abundant secretory granules and pyelonism. But these cells usually not seen in H and E section. They can be seen in acid plus staining or pH E staining or E sundered immune histochemical markers which stains the granules of the state of the cells. If we come to the excretory component of the equine gland, excretory component is comprised of the three segments. One is the convoluted duct, the interstreet dermal component and the intraepidermal component where through the equine duct open to the exterior that is called the atrosphyringium. The convoluted duct and straight dermal duct portion of the eccrine glands show the similar histomorphology. There is usually double layer of cubital cells and which lack the myoepithelial layer. And there is a uh, direct, con con direct continuation of the secretory glands to this convoluted excretory ducts. And the absence of myoepithelial layer can be easily identified if we do some myoepithelial I immunomarkers as like in this picture. The glandular portion of the eccrine glands show the presence of myepithelial cells in the periphery that the myepithelial markers are positive here. And however, the, in the central portion, the duct or excretory component of the eccrine glands are there and which doesn't have myepithelial layer and that is not being highlighted by the immune marker. And there is a luminal cells of the ducts and show the presence of some layer of tonofilament and that from the cuticular border. This cuticular border is again can be seen in eccrine neoplasms like poroma. The acrosyringium which is the interdermal component of the excretory duct of eccrine gland and it is really the helicoidal pores or uh, helicoidal uh, structure having the excretory duct with single layer of luminal cells and two to three layers of outer cells. And this acrosyringium also contain the keratohyaline granules. That means they can secrete keratin independently. Coming to the apocrine glands, as like eccrine glands, apocrine glands are again out of two parts. So one is the secretory component, other is the excretory component. And here the secretory component lies somewhat lower than the eccrine gland plane and that is they usually present in the subcutaneous fat or in the deep terms and there is a presence of inner layer on luminal cells and these luminal cells if you see in the high power they have the cuboidal or columnar in appearance with flat or outer myopithelial layer these are the myopithelial cell layers and in the luminal portion there is a secretory glandular apocrine cells and there is a Apocrine method of secretion is seen that that is the cytoplasmic component is dislodged from the cells and uh, comes to the lumen. And these luminal cells contain lipid, iron, lipofusion, or PST granules. And uh, there, the other kinds of secretion like melocrine, where the secretory granules within the vesicles come to the cytoplasm, or holocrine, as like the CBC glands, the intercell or again come to the lumen as a secretion. These two kinds of secretory pattern can also be seen in the 
এবং ফ্রেমিক ল্যান্ড তাহলে তো এক্সক্রিটরি কম্পোনেন্ট দিস ইজ লাইক দা ইক্রাইন গ্ল্যান্ডস দে হ্যাভ দা ডাবল লেয়ার অফ কিবডাল সেলস দ্যাট টুমিনাল সেলস কন্টেইন মাইক্রোভিলাই এন্ড কেরাটিন ফিলামেন্ট ইন সাইটোপ্লাজম গিভিং এ ইসোনোফিলিক হারলিন অ্যাপিয়ারেন্স নো মাইপিথেলিয়াল সেল ইজ প্রেজেন্ট अगेन হিয়ার এন্ড দিস এপোক্রাইন এক্সক্রিটরি পার্টস আর অলওয়েজ কানেক্টেড টু দা ফাইলোসিবিসিস ফলিকুল as like ecrine gland the excretory ducts are open to actosynium in the epidermis here the excretory ducts are connected to the pilocybicis even this apocrine glands are usually seen in the axilla or anogenital region or mammary region or around the eye leaf like the mole's gland or in the external ear canal like the cerebellus gland the common histochemical marker which can be seen uh, which can be expressed in apocrine glands are the CEA. This CEA is present as we have seen in the picture of the intercellular canvary leaf that the, the CEA is expressed on the luminal border of the secretory cells of eccrine gland and excretory eccrine ducts and apocrine gland. And other markers are GCDFA15 or epithelial memory antigen. These are also the other positive eccrine glands. I mean to the apocrine gland. This apocrine glands actually developed from the eccrine gland during the puberty. They are seen in human axilla. They are around 45% of all axillary sweat glands are apocrine gland in a young person. And they have direct secretory portion of the, as the same morphology as of apocrine glands. And but it contains some component of the eccrine glands like the dark cells or intercellular canonically can be seen here. and this tubs doesn't open on hair follicle they are open directly on the epidermis now after the epidermis we come to the dermis dermis is actually a dynamic supportive connective tissue which contains some cells with fibrous tissue and ground substance and adhesive structures and vascular and nerve plexus categorically dermis are divided into two parts one is the papillary dermis which is the superficial one and is present in between the reticular ridges of the epidermis and the reticular dermis which is a much more thicker than the papillary dermis and present just up to the above of the hypodermis the adventitial dermis covers the papillary and periadmixial dermis if we look the structures of the papillary and reticular dermis in papillary dermis there is there is presence of loose loose meshwork of collagen and also there is some haphazard arrays of thin elastic tissue thin elastic fibers in the papillary dermis and papillary dermis is composed of mostly type 3 collagen which is mixed with some type of type 1 collagen and there is presence of abundant ground substance fibroblast in capillaries of superficial arterial and venous plate If you look at the reticular dermis, reticular dermis is thicker, and it has a thick collagen bundles and lying or lying horizontally in one above the another, like horizontal to the skin surface. They are composed mostly of the type one collagen, and they also contain the thick elastic fibers which are fragmented in appearance. The ground substance and vessels of the deep plexus are present in reticular dermis. If you look at the pictures of the papillary dermis in the mesenchymal stain, there is a loose connective tissue component in the papillary dermis with some haphazard orientation of the collagens, and in contrast to the thick collagen bundles in the reticular dermis, and which also show the bidefringence. And if you do elastic stain, the papillary dermis shows the thin elastic fibers, and which is which are haphazardly oriented. and the reticular dermis shows a thick elastic fibers and which are horizontal to the skin surface and they are fragmented if you look at the cells of the dermis there are presence of some dermal dendritic cells along with fibroblast mast cell macrophage these are the cells can be seen in the dermis the dermal dendritic cells are actually a heterogeneous group of cells and they are show heterogeneity in immunophenotypic expression and also in functions mostly three types of dermal dendritic cells are seen one is a factor 13a positive dermal dendrocytes they are present in the 
perivascular zone in the papillary dermis and also around the sweat glands. And there is CD34 positive dendrocytes. Those are present in the meat and deep dermis around the admixa. And there is presence of Langerhans cells like dendrocytes, which are present in perivascular distribution. And they show, they do dermal antigen presentation. They express HDDR or CD1A, but they lack the beta cannulas, as like the epidermal Langerhans cells. Fibroblasts can also be present in dermis. They synthesize all types of fibers in the substance. They contain prominent, well-developed rough in the plasma reticulars in their reticula in their side. Mast cells are also present in dermis. They derive from the bone marrow CD34 positive progenitor cells. They are sparsely distributed in and on the perivascular and periadnexal zone in the dermis. They have darkly stained ovoid nuclei with coarse granular cytoplasm. These cytoplasmic granules can be highlighted by the tolerating blue and chimsha. And in IHC, they are positive for the thicket CD117 and tryptase. In mastocytosis, there is growth and accumulation of the mast cells in various organs in body with heterogeneous manifestation. And common skin manifestation is articaria pigmentosa. And macrophage, which are present in the dermis canals, can be seen or highlighted by the visible pigment they have ingested in the cytoplasm. The ground substance of the dermis. The ground substance actually fills the space between the fibers and the dermal cells. The ground substance present in the small amounts, they are seen in the routine H and in staining as the empty spaces in between the collagen bundles. Mostly the glycosaminoglycans glycans and acid mucopolysaccharides are present. And these ground substances can be identified by the alcyon blue and toledin blue. And the disorders where there is increased production of these ground substances like dermal mucinosis or granuloma annulare, these ground substances can be seen as bluish material. <coughs> Coming to the subcutaneous tissue or hypodermis, hypodermis is helps in the thermal regulation of the body and they also help in the insulation. They provide the energy and protection from mechanical injury. They show the presence of lobings of mature fatty tissue or mature adipocytes, which are separated by the fibrous septi. And these lobules, uh, these cells are positive for the A and environmentin. And when there is inflammation around this lob uh, subcutis or hypodermis, the inflammation can be with the uh, septal distribution when it is called the septal paniculitis or the inflammation can be involved, can involve the interlobular fat when it is called the lobular paniculitis. The septal paniculitis is seen in many disorders like a nodosum and lobular paniculitis can be seen in leprosy or sweet syndrome. If you look carefully that the, there is an inflammation or binding of the interlobular septa in the subcutis or hypodermis and with the infiltration of some lymphocytes or plasma cells or more cells are there and relatively in the lobules the, the adipocytes contain relatively less involved by the inflammation so it is a septal kind of paniculitis and in the contrast to the right hand side picture there is the interlobule is infiltrated by the mononuclear cells with uh, loss of fat plane in some spaces and so this is called the lobular paniculitis <coughs> coming to the blood vessel lymphatics nerve and muscle of the dermis in the blood vessels, the large artery or veins are situated around the interlobular septa in the subcutis. And the network of the smaller artery or veins, they form the superficial plexus and deep plexus. Superficial plexus is present in the junction of the papillary and reticular dermis. And deep plexus is present in the junction of the reticular dermis and subcutis. Inflammatory disorder involving the, these vasculatures can involve the superficial or deep, term, deep uh, vascular plexus or may involve the bone. And the vascular structures can be highlighted by the immunostains like non-adulibrant factor, pimentin, CD34, CD31, etc. 
The inflammatory condition of the vessel wall is called the vasculitis and there is some morphological and diagnostic criteria for the vasculitis and mere presence of inflammatory cells in the perivascular zone is not vasculitis. To call it a vasculitis, the inflammatory cells could infiltrate the vessel wall with the signs of the vascular injury. That is, there should be presence of edema, there should be presence of extravasation for disease and there uh, the destruction of the vessel wall by the inflammatory cells, there may be presence of leukocytoplasis, uh, there may be presence of thrombi in the lumen or fibular necrosis might be there. This fibular necrosis is the sign of the true vasculitis. Here you can see that the upper reticular dermis vessels show the diffuse infiltration of plenty of neutrophils with leukocytoplasis, that is the cell debris are there in the stroma. The vessel wall can not be easily identified with the extravasation of the are there, and there is also presence of fibrinoid degeneration or fibrinoid necrosis, which is the sure shot sign of the true vasculitis. Glomus is uh, seen in the axils in the reticular dermis, and here there is a there is a uh, anastomosing junction between the artery and vein, and without the presence of the capillary. And this junction is actually uh, surrounded by four to six layers of the glomus cells. The glomus cells have the prevascular smooth muscle component and they act as a sphincter on the vessels and thereby they help in the thermal regulation. And the tumor arises from this area is known as a glomus tumor. Look at the lymphatics. Lymphatics accompany the venules in the dermis and they have a similar morphological structure except that there is presence of some valves around them and the endothelium of the lymphatics does not routinely stain with the polyurban factor of CD34. They are highlighted by the D240 in stain. And the nerve bundles, the large nerve bundles are distributed in the reticular dermis and subcutin and other small nerve bundles or nerve waves are distributed in all the layers of the skin and they may extend up to the papillary dermis and epidermis Contain free nerve axon cells with the Langerhans cells. There is some nerve ending organs. These are the specialized organ for the some special kind of sensation. There is some of the nerve ending organs are present in the superficial dermis and in the papillary dermis. They are seen in the palm and soles, known as the main nerve corpuscle. There is a laminations of the Schwann cells around the axons with mechanical receptor for sense of touch and the similar structure also seen in the deep dermis or subcutis, the reticular dermis and uh, these are called the passinian corpuscle and they are seen in weight bearing areas and they are the receptor for deep pressure and vibration. Coming to the muscles of the dermis, the commonest skin muscle is the erector pili muscle and this is the erector pili muscle which is associated with the hair follicle and these erector pili muscles are inserted in the outer sheath of the hair follicle and to the other end inserted in the dermal collagen. Besides erector pili muscle, there are presence of some smooth muscle fascicles may be present in the uh, in skins of the external genitalia or areola, nipple areola like the diatus muscle and some strange strands of genital muscle can also be seen in the dermis of the skin of face, neck, eyelid and which helps in facial expression. So this is in brief the historical structures of the skin and adnexa and now we can uh, discuss some other factors like the historical difference of skin with age and how the skin evolves with the aging of a man, aging of a person and in the newborn and children the epidermis shows the same thickness as of the adult epidermis except for the actual skins where the, there is greater density of the melanocyte and lining cells. The dermis is more cellular in case of neonate and children and there is presence of increased crown substance and equine glands are in higher number at birth and gradually when the person grows old the apocrine glands are started to develop after puberty and CVC's glands are developed in newborn but it doesn't contain any secretion. The secretion starts after puberty under the help of 
and reinst under the help of and reinst stimulation. In the subcutaneous tissue in the newborn as children, the adipocytes are of thin walled and larger, and there is a significant presence of brown fat is there, and which comprises around five percent of the total body weight. And when the uh, baby grows older, the brown fat component gradually decreases and disappears in the adulthood. In this brown adipocytes are rich in mitochondria and contain multiple cytoplasmic vacuoles of varying size with central nuclei. And they also contain abundant blood filled capillaries. And these two factors, as they increase mitochondria and increase blood filled capillaries, leads to generation of heat. The thermogenesis is the main function of this brown fat by degenerating fat molecules into fatty acids. And coming to the elderly uh, uh, person, when the uh, person grows old in the epidermis, the cells become de deranged haphazardly due to aberrant proliferation of the basal cell layer and this haphazard derangement and increased turnover may lead to some neoplastic conditions and malignancies and there is also reduced reduction in the number of melanocytes and melanosomes and that's why there is less pigmentation in the adult or older skin and this their skin is more prone to develop damage by the ultraviolet radiation and there is also reduction in the number and function of the Langerhans cells and thereby the degeneration of the immune function of the skin. In the dermis, the uh, dermis becomes thinned out and with the relatively acellular and avascular component, avascular stroma. The collagen elastin fibers and ground sustenance are also reduced and elastic fibers altered structurally and functionally. That's why they, they have become less elastic and collagen becomes stiffer and thicker. That is the resilience of the dermis becomes less and the dermis becomes less stretchable. And that's why the more prone, they, are, they become more prone to wrinkling and wrinkling uh, can be visible more in the older individuals. The eccrine and apocrine glands are also reduced in number and the secretion is also diminished. And in the subcutaneous tissue, there is a subcutaneous fat is diminished in the face, sheen, hand and feet and abnormal fat deposition occurs in abdomen in case of men and in the thigh on the thigh in case of women and the decreased function of mesonal and persinian corpus cells are seen in elderly individual. Here is the skin of elderly individual where there is epidermal thinning or atrophy the epidermis can be seen and the dermis is also so the lesser number of collagen and lesser number of growth substances and hypodermis fat is also diminished. Okay. And if we see the skin of different body parts or different body sites or different anatomical sites, there is also some difference in the uh, structure of the skin. And this study, this idea we should have because any bi skin biopsy, if the site is not mentioned, and then, then in some parts of the body there are some specialized changes in the skin morphology, and uh, that may be mistaken from maybe mistaken as some disorder or some pathology in that portion of the skin. Like in, in case of scalp, when there is increased hair follicles in the skin, and that hair follicles can extend through the dermis up to the subcutaneous tissue plane and waves up to the fat plane, and which is not usually seen in other parts of the body. In case of skin of face, there is increased number of sebaceous glands and these sebaceous glands are more increased in the skin of nose and that may be mistaken as some sebaceous gland neoplasm if the site is not specified. And in the eyelid, the epidermis is thin. There is two to three layers of cells in the eyelid uh, with basaloid epithelial buds and there is presence of modified apocrine glands like the glands of moles and villus hair may be present. If we look at the skin of trunk or bag, there is a reticular dermis is white enough and widely thickened, and that may be mistaken like scleroderma, if the site is not mentioned. And the skin of umbilicus, there is also presence of thick and fibrotic dermis. If you see the picture, so this is the skin of the nose, and you can see that there is a plenty of sebaceous gland with hair follicles, and it may be resembled like sebaceous gland neoplasm. And in the skin of scalp, there is a plenty of hair follicles, and these hair follicles can be uh, deep rooted. That is, they may extend up to the subcutaneous fat plane. 
And in the scheme from the back, we can see that there is more thickened reticular dermis. And this might be mistaken as scleroderma or something, connective tissue disorder. This is the skin from the axilla where we can see the apocrine glands, which are present in deep percutaneous tissue plane. This is the skin from the palm and sole, and where there is a presence of stratum lucidum here. There is stratum lucidum with thin, with thick corneal layer, and also there is no apocrine gland in the dermis. And this glands, uh, this area of skin is rich in eccrine glands, so so it glands. So by the soil, the stratum lucidum is present, the thick, compact, cornified layer and lack of basketweed pattern. There's numerous eccrine units, nerve and organs and glomer structures are present. No pilocybaceous unit is there. And if you look at the skin of lower leg, there is a much more, more chance of increased uh, spaces of the uh, papillary vasculatures and they are also thick walled. In garments of skin of external genitalia and nipple areola, there is presence of some smooth muscles, fascicles in the dermis. In skin of face, neck, and eyelid, there is presence of skeletal muscle fascicles in the dermis. In the microcutaneous junction, there is lack of granular and cornified layer. And the cells of squamous cell layer are larger and contain more glycogen and salivary gland tissue may be present in the microcutaneous junction skin. Like in those microcutaneous junction skin, we can see some striated muscles in the dermis. And in the mucous portion, there is a presence of salivary gland structures in the dermis. And in this is the skin from the ear lobule, and where we can see the presence of cartilage with some villous hair structures. This is skin from the leg, and where we can see some vascular stasis in the papillary dermis. There's a more increased thick walled vessels with in the papillary dermis can be seen. And this is the skin from the nipple areola where there is presence of smooth muscle fascicles in the dermis. To handle the skin biopsy specimen, the skin biopsy specimen should be fixed immediately after collection in the normal vapor formalin. And if there is a recreation for direct immunofluorescence, then the, we should use Michel's medium. And uh, the, the biopsy can be put in the saline soaked fall if processed within 24 hours. And for flow cytometer molecular studies, we should stain the fresh samples in saline soot pouch and it should be processed as early as possible. And specimen, when embedded, they should be on age and so that the entire dermis, epidermis, and hypodermis can be seen. Coming to the artifacts in skin biopsy, the artifacts may be due to some poor histology preparation that hampered the morphologic evaluation of the slides. Uh, there may be inadequate fixation due to inadequate volume or insufficient fixation time or improper quality of the fixative and inadequate processing may be there that includes the that includes the some uh, problem in the cutting or the temperature of water bath or quality of staining solution or quality of uh, that might be older staining solution might hamper the proper staining of the skin biopsy and uh, there may be artifact due to biopsy sampling, like when the sample is collected, if there is increased cautery is done, the cautery effect can be seen here. The cell nucleus are fragmented and they, they become much more elongated and no architectural uh, arrangement is there actually. Everything is being haphazard and this, this is this may it might also happen with the crushing of the skin biopsy. If it's not handled properly, the increased crushing of the sample can cause these kinds of artifacts and that might have hamper with the proper regulation of the skin biopsy sections. And if the specimen is stored in a very low temperature, there may be presence of some freezing artifact. As you can see, there is a nuclear vacuolation in the epidermis and also in the stratum corneum layer. The common staining methods of the skin biopsy are uh, mostly the well prepared H and his stain helps in diagnose most of the skin biopsies. Other than HNA stain, we can do PA staining and which helps in the assessment of the thickness of the basin membrane. And PA also helps in the identification of the glycogen and presence of fungus can be highlighted by PA staining. We can do GMS, and there is glomerulus methanin in silver for presence of fungus or cutaneous pneumocystis carini. We can do ZN stain and fight stain for to demonstrate acid organisms. We can do trans stain to demonstrate the bacteria. 
We can do button style stain to demonstrate spirochetes and basilar angiomatosis. We can do gene shock, which highlights the mast cells and also highlights the presence of leishmania. The cutaneous leishmaniasis can be highlighted by the gene sustaining. We can do lysi carmine to identify the mucins. We can do Elsian blue that helps the in highlighting acid mycopolysaccharide in pH 2.5 and sulfated mycopolysaccharide in pH 0.5. We can do concorate, which highlights the presence of amyloid. We can do elastic magnesium, highlighted by this. And we can do immunofluorescence. Immunofluorescence helps in the autoimmune uh, uh, gullus disorders. Uh, we, we, we hear usually the direct immunofluorescence is done and this involves a tissue and we, this is done from the cryostat sections of the cryostat tissue sections and we can also do the indirect immunofluorescence and where the patient serum is being used and coming to the common immunohistochemical marker which helps in the identification of skin disorders we can use the epithelial markers the commonest epithelial markers are the low molecular weight keratin there is a cam 5.2 or and say cytokeratin A1, A3 can be used. We can use CEA or EMA, and this highlights the eccrine or apocrine glandular components or excretory components. And also the stratigraphic scores epithelium. And uh, we can use the melanocytic markers like a sunred melanin HME45. We can use the mesenchymal markers like the vimentin, which stains the dendritic cells or macrophages. Factor 13A, the fibroblast like mesenchymal cells, normal dendrocytes are stained, uh, highlighted by this, and uh, we can use the endothelial markers like horn and bone factors, C31, C34, to highlight the vascular structures. And this C34 or factor 13A also characteristically uh, seen in DFSP. And the Langerhans cells and uh, Langerhans cell cystocytosis, we can use CD1A, Langerine is 100. Multiple cell carcinoma, here we can use the characteristic CK20 staining. The, there is a peri perinuclear uh, stain deposition, peri perinuclear, highlight, uh, perinuclear molecules are being highlighted the CK20, the cytoskeletal molecules, cytokeratin molecules, and uh, we can also use a neuron specific enolase or promocranin or cyanotrophycin for multiple cell carcinoma. And obviously, we can use a KI67. And which helps in differentiating the uh, cell differentiation rate uh, that is that helps us to differentiate benigns and malignant lesion. So this is uh, uh, overall about the skin histologic skin and adnexal histological uh, histology and along with some other elements of skin biopsy how we can uh, identify different parts of the skin of our body and also the handling of the biases specimen and common immune markers are common cytochemical uh, stains. So thank you. Thank you all for your patient hearing. Thank you.